other promotions, some shifts around as well. One of the names that's been put up now and been welcomed into the ministry is Michael Suka, and he joins me now on the program. Michael Suka, thanks for your time. Congratulations, of course, on being made the Assistant Minister to the Treasurer. Can I ask you what's going to be your real focus in this area, perhaps finally getting to that surplus? Well, uh, morning, Tom. It's great to be with you. Uh, obviously, as the uh, Assistant Minister to the Treasurer, uh, my remit is to support all of the responsibilities of the tre Treasurer. And, um, you know, obviously, in the lead up to the budget, there are huge amounts of work. I'll also be working more broadly with the, uh, the broader economic team of Kelly O'Dwyer and Michael McCormack. Uh, and there'll also be, uh, for me, I think uh, some issues that I'll be able to uh, take the lead on in a sense uh, and run with and one of those will be uh, housing affordability. Of course, uh, Tom, the, uh, the, the budget, getting the budget into balance uh, as we know will uh, uh, be in balance over the forward estimates uh, is something that we are very focused on. Uh, expenditure restraint is extraordinarily important and we are of course the party of surpluses. Um, so we'll be working towards that end, um, but uh, there are no easy saves, uh, as you know, uh, and there are no, uh, no easy paths to surplus, but uh, uh, the Treasurer has done an extraordinary job in setting out a credible path to budget balance, and uh, I look really forward to um, supporting him in that endeavour. We'll get to housing affordability in a moment. If I could just ask you as well, though, your promotion, obviously you're a conservative side of your party. Labor is already trying to paint this in some elements as, you know, Malcolm Turnbull having to promote the conservative side, uh, maybe, you know, as part of a quid pro quo to stay in power. How do you react to that? Well, I'm a member of the Liberal Party and unlike uh, Labor, we don't operate under a factional system. Um, we have a system where, to the greatest extent possible, people are promoted uh, on a merit-based process and um, I suppose I'd like to hope that uh, I've been promoted on merit, uh, but we don't have the hard factional system, so I know that's difficult for uh, members of the Labor Party to understand, but uh, we don't carve up the spoils but, according but different to groups, the instructions you know, of our union don't they, bosses. Minister? They might not be hard factions in that sort of, you know, as you say, the brutal calculus of one in, one out. But there is still, you know, different groups that congregate around various policy ideas. Of course there are, but uh, that's not the basis upon which ministers are appointed. And I don't think that's uh, why I've been appointed. I don't think it was why, perhaps notwithstanding the speculation previously, why, um, you know, I perhaps and others haven't been... Uh, appointed to the ministry in the past. I think it's a merit-based process. I okay. have said this often. I don't... I don't... Uh, uh, I think the Prime Minister has a very difficult decision uh, with a wealth of talent on our backbench, and I'm just very honoured uh, to, uh, to have been appointed uh, the Assistant uh, Minister to the Treasurer. Getting on to housing affordability, because we had the latest figures out on loans in November. It showed a real spike again in those investor loans versus owner-occupiers. So, you know, this dangerous shift where you're getting more investors into the market than owner-occupiers, which I think you'd agree you don't want to get out of kilter. I know you're not considering negative gearing changes, but what about what happens in the US where instead of being able to have tax deductions on interest on an investment property, you get one only on the house you own and live in? Isn't that a, a better incentive for people to own their own home? Well, Tom, um, there are unfortunately no silver bullets uh, in the housing affordability space and let's remember um, housing affordability issues in a sense have crept up on us over many decades this is not a new phenomenon um, housing uh, price growth in Australia has been strong in the sector again for many decades uh, I think also that there's no one level of government that um, controls all the levers to uh, ultimately address housing affordability it's Literally, uh, policies at a local government, state government and federal government level combined, which, um, which some of which uh, have an impact on housing affordability. So I don't think there is any one single solution, including the one you've just mentioned. I suspect um, there will be a suite of measures from all levels of government required. My view and my instinct is, um, rather than the Labor Party approach, which is to say, 
we will try to limit demand of housing, we will try and ration housing, uh, we actually need to be uh, pursuing policies that increase the supply of housing stock. And ultimately, if the supply of housing stock increases at uh, a level uh, that can meet the demand, then that will put downward pressure on prices and provide people right, with the but, opportunity to enter the housing market. But if investors are still the ones getting in there, that's still an issue. I mean, you used to be a, a tax specialist. You know how incentive works. What do you think of that principle, that you turn the incentive from encouraging people, which is what the tax system does, to get into investment of properties, switch that over time, perhaps, to owner-occupiers like the US does? What do you think of that as a principle? Well, the tax system... Well, I suppose, Tom, I have to just address the... the sort of the context of that question. The tax system, um, in a sense, doesn't uh, provide any incentives to invest uh, in one form of asset class or another, including uh, in residential property. Um, for example, if you were to borrow uh, money to purchase shares on the Australian Stock Exchange, you could negatively gear those just as equally as you could negatively gear... Yeah, sure, sorry, because I, I, I don't asset. want to get too so, bogged down in this, but obviously I'm meaning we're talking about, yes, you can negatively gear a whole host of things, not just housing, but there is an incentive mm. within the housing market for investors that is not there for owner-occupiers. Well, I, I think it's been... Um, yeah, if you look at the statistics, Tom, uh, the vast majority of people who invest in housing are not extraordinarily wealthy. They're middle-income Australians. For many, uh, including uh, many people that I know, um, it's often the only way that, or it's the first step that they have in securing their own financial freedom with one investment property. We're not talking about 10 or 20. We're talking about one investment property. And I don't think uh, we want to limit the aspiration of people to do that. Equally, we don't want... Uh, a society where um, young people in particular um, feel as though the aspiration of purchasing a home is out of reach. We want it, I want okay. it to be a realistic option and I will be working extraordinarily hard over the coming months uh, to ensure that we, um, we can impact the framework uh, of regulations, laws, uh, both at a federal, state and local government level uh, to give people, young people in particular, that realistic opportunity to save and purchase a home. So, it's so important for us. So just society. very quickly, there's, there's no inclination towards the, the US model of tax incentives at all? Just very quickly on that? Well, Tom, I will examine, uh, and I know that the Treasurer will look at all good ideas, but I'm not going to announce them the day after I've been announced as the Assistant Minister to the Treasurer. So uh, we'll have more to say in coming months. All right, fair enough. We'll consider that one on the table for now. I want to turn your attention, because you talk about the difficulty of getting back to budget, to the audit report on the Immigration Department. Now, we had a release from Peter Dutton on this that in several paragraphs just said this is the fault of Labor and the Greens and boat arrivals. But, you know, to take you to one specific example, he had a billion-dollar extension to Transfield's 2014 contract. That contract, of course, was signed after the Coalition came into power. And the amendment was made in 2016, so three years after the coalition came to power. It was done according to the audit office without documented consideration of value for money. And somehow this is Labor's fault. How does that make sense? Well, I suppose, Tom, we're not going to take any lectures from the Labor Party on prudent spending in the immigration portfolio. Let's remember that uh, any costs associated um, with... Uh, those who have arrived on, on, on unauthorised vessels came here under Labor's watch. Now, we know that um, the, the spending uh, in that portfolio blew out by $11 billion uh, when Labor was last in government. Uh, I think we've been able to save many billions of dollars by uh, getting control of our borders. And uh, I'm not familiar with the precise sentence you've just read out or the precise expenditure, but I know that... We've banked many billions of savings in that portfolio and uh, I think Labor okay. should hang their heads in shame and thank us for those savings and not question um, uh, expenditure, necessary expenditure in dealing with the problem that they created. OK, let's take all that as a given because the, the boats did stop under the Coalition. We know they've saved a lot of money. But this is showing that contracts signed under the Coalition in your time in office 
money could have been better spent. I mean, there's got to be a clear delineation, doesn't there, between when Labor left office and you started and the contra contracts were signed after that point. Well, I don't understand what the alternative is. So the money could be better spent. Who, who's arguing and uh, which Labor spokesman's argued that, uh, that the money could be better spent and how could it be better spent? Well, well this, I mean, is, we this are is the managing, National Audit we're Office. Managing so, sorry, Minister, but this is the National Audit sure. Office saying that the, the contract sure. was done without documented consideration of value for money. So basically, did they figure out the cheapest way to do it? There's no evidence of that. So it's not Labor actually, you know, they've jumped up and down since. But this is the Audit Office saying this. Sure, sure. But I, I think what we can uh, say is that the minister in this portfolio, uh, who's done an extraordinary job in stopping the boats uh, and continuing the success of Scott Morrison, uh, has had a very close eye uh, on expenditure in his portfolio. As I said, this is somebody who has banked many billions of dollars of savings in that portfolio. And I think that track record uh, gives me comfort uh, that every dollar spent in that portfolio has been spent wisely and has been spent okay. to treat people in a humane way, but also in a way uh, that uh, ensures the integrity of our borders. Very quickly, um, the age of entitlement over for business, we know that SPC in Victoria was denied any sort of government handout. Now, it's worked out pretty well for the company, but Alcoa is a different beast. It's going to get $40 million uh, from the federal government, it looks like, and 200 from the state government over the next four years. Continued subsidies for this company. Why doesn't it stand or fall on its own two feet? Well, uh, Alcoa, uh, I think, has 540 uh, employees. I think it, it supports about 2,000 uh, employees uh, more broadly, uh, or 2,000 jobs more broadly in its community. Uh, my understanding is that the federal government has provided a $40 million interest-free loan, uh, and the Victorian state government, uh, in exchange for uh, a power subsidy that was ceased, uh, is providing some uh, $200 million. Uh, this is, uh, in a sense, uh, consistent with government policy over many decades with heavy industry. Uh, this, unfortunately, is a consequence of, um, I suppose, uh, the, the increased costs of electricity uh, and the inability of the Victorian state government to provide an electricity subsidy that was in place for many years. So. Uh, we okay. think that a, an, int an interest-free loan from the federal government is consistent uh, with that approach and uh, where we can support um, 540 direct jobs and 2,000 indirect jobs in a way that we'll see taxpayers repaid uh, is a worthy investment. Assistant Minister Michael Suker, congratulations on the promotion again and thanks for your time today on AIM Agenda. Thanks, Tom.